My name is Nanette Carter um, and I'd like to welcome you all to Swinburne, so warm in Jaker. Um, also, I'd like to uh, acknowledge our partners, Heidi. We're very excited to be able to present this um, symposium this afternoon and uh, we have such wonderful speakers and I'm sure you're going to really um, enjoy it. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people um, and their elders past and present who are the traditional owners of the land in which Swinburne's Hawthorne campus is located. The Swinburne community is honoured to recognise our connection to Wurundjeri country, to its history, culture and spirituality, and strive to ensure that we operate in a manner that respects and honours the elders and ancestors of this land. We also acknowledge the traditional owners of lands across Australia, their elders, ancestors, cultures, heritage and emerging leaders. So today's um, Beyond Nostalgia, Designing for Change, Design Symposium, begins with another acknowledgement the, of the efforts of Grant Featherston, designer of the iconic contour chair and the other chairs we have here, to raise what he saw as the key questions facing designers and architects, how to live in a post-industrialised, technological and urbanised world. As Dr Denise Whitehouse reminds us in Design for Life, Grant and Mary Featherston, Grant Featherston sought to make design for social need as important as design for social financial profit. With the help of our guest speakers, Denise Whitehouse, Jeremy McLeod, Mary Featherston and Ewan McEwen, we'll explore key social issues in contemporary design practices this afternoon. Firstly, without glossing over modernism's faults or inflating its virtues, we'll consider what designers and others may learn from our heritage of mid-century modernism. We'll encounter ways of designing better, more affordable housing that is more well-connected to community and is less damaging to the environment. We'll learn how the livability of our cities might not only be ameliorated but actually improved by effective design. We'll be presented with approaches and strategies used to respond to the diverse needs of diverse communities and groups in designing educational spaces. And finally, we'll learn how new materials and new and emergent technologies might inform design that seeks to improve the quality of our lives. Implicit in these discussions are issues around urban consolidation, equality of opportunity in housing and education, accessible design, design for sustainability, and design for nature. Now, to introduce our first speaker. Denise Whitehouse is a design and cultural historian who established an innovative and award-winning series of programs of design history and theory taught at Swinburne to a generation of designers, and some of, some of them are, are here today. During her time as an educator, Denise became engaged in building a critical discourse about the history of design in Australia as both a practice and a mode of cultural production. Her essay, The State of Design, as a, a design History as a Discipline, features in David Brodie's and Hazel Clark's essential 2009 book, Design Studies, a Reader. Four years ago, Denise established DARN, the Design History Australia Research Network, a research and publication site for designers, scholars, teachers and students interested in Australian design and culture. DARN is aimed at encouraging collaborations uh, between institutions, uh, academics, amateur historians, curators, collectors and designers in sharing knowledge and building an Australian design history. Recently, Denise has completed a double magnum opus, writing Design for Life, Grant and Mary Featherston, and co-curating the exhibition of that name with Kirsty Grant, currently on show at Heidi Museum of Modern Art, and for which everyone here, of course, has tickets to see. So, um, welcome, Denise. Now, Nanette sent me some questions. So, I'll read the first one to me, to you. And that was, why an exhibition and a book on Grant and Mary Featherston at this time? Are, um, are the, you know, is the exhibition and the book a response to the popularity of mid-century modern and its nostalgia for a golden period of Australian design, that period when you know, there was design by Australians for Australians and everything looked really rosy? Um, is it because of the iconic um, status of the um, contour chair, so to speak? 
Her other question was, with this, is are there any useful lessons about how design has been practised in Australia to be gathered from looking at the career of Grant and Mary Featherstone and doing the exhibition of it? What can we learn from them, so to speak? Um, and I suppose the first thing to say, as we would all agree, is that Grant and Mary Featherstone uh, are, prob are the most significant design partnership in the history of Australian design, we could argue that. But we can also argue very comfortably that Grant Featherstone's The Furniture Herb is the most significant aesthetic and technically excellent um, furniture herb uh, in, in the history of Australian design. Why at this moment, well, as I was driving here today, we came past a, um, you know, a real estate agent's um, advertisement for the house behind it, and their featured centre was the beautiful scape chair. So there's such a heightened interest in this area at the moment, and within Featherston, who are they, what was their significance, etc. The moment has been, you know, I've been working on it for years, as everybody will know, and the moment, and I have tried to get the exhibition up before, but there's a at the right moment, I think, is the moment things have come together with the help of Kirsty Grant, my wonderful co-curator. Um, and I think this interest in post-war, in, in post mid-century modern design has been triggered to a large degree by Kirsty's um, groundbreaking 2014 exhibition of mid-century modern furniture. So, you know, there's this huge enthusiasm Following, our, following the closing of the, the um, Heidi design, there will be the Clem and Meadmore um, design exhibition as well. Next year, there's the Robin Boyd. Um, there'll be a whole set of Robin Boyd exhibitions throughout Victoria at the same time. So there's, there's, the moment is right, so to speak. Um, and what I... Is it about nostalgia? No, I don't think so. I've been thinking about that. And I think that we are at a moment of significant change, a moment when societies reassess. And it's not unlike the post-war era, so to speak, you know, and other moments of social significant change, such as the 1960s, when societies assess, reassess their directions and their values. And at the centre of that are questions about the quality of life. Um, you know, Nanette listed today's issues, issues such as urban density planning, you know, um, climate, um, material, short, you know, natural resources and all of those. They're not new questions. Those questions, I discovered, have been around for a long time. But what we do at certain times as a society is go back to those and rework them, and design is central to that. And I wonder if in the type of mid-century... Um, modern uh, phase at the moment with lots of new people playing, uh, starting to create a new history of that era, whether we're seeing in this a need for reassessment and a seeking out of social and personal, the social and personal value of design. Perhaps the ease of living that was the ideal of Grant Featherston and his contemporaries, a notion of simplicity, of beauty and function above all other things, and function including how one sits in one's community, one's sense of place, one's sense of identity in space. And these are the issues, it's, uh, issues that are central to the practice of Grant and Mary Featherston and that Kirsty and I have sought to explore in the exhibition Design for Life using the wonderfully rich Featherston archive. For, for um, those who have not visited the exhibition yet, it is essentially a comprehensive coverage of an innovative multidiscipline professional practice reaching from the 1946 to today. While the practice encompassed um, glass fashion accessories, interior design of all kinds and contemporary furniture, um, it was dedicated to social, technical and material innovation. Behind the beguiling beauty of the contour chair and the joy of oboe and numero and Mary's Children's Museum is the Featherston's passionate commitment to design that matters 
to the belief that the quality of the human experience should be the fundamental principle from which all design should start and end. Innovation with materials and technologies, yes, definitely, but in response to the human need and for the benefit of all. In this, the Featherstons were unapologetic modernists whose practice was grounded in the humanist belief that the duty of the designer is to bring the human experience and need to an increasingly artificial capitalist world. To engage, as Boyd and Featherston would say, with big ideas and big questions, questions about the type of world that we want to live in, our responsibilities to the natural world, to our world, you know, how to be a civil society, so to speak, and how to do this with understanding of human need, of the psychological, the physiological, the social, the cultural, the technical, etc. How, for example, to help people negotiate change, and we are in this period of really conflicting change at the moment. Um, how to help people to um, negotiate change. How, for instance, to help the post-war generation to, in their return to civilian life in making homes, making families again. And the contour chair, you know, is a response to that. It's a response to the need for a, a new language of housing that the, um, and a, nice, a need for healing and comfort in its beauty. The contour chair sits within the very small home and it adds... It, Enlightened, sorry, it doesn't enlighten. It opens out its space. It has a transparency about it which makes those small spaces uh, easy to move around in and it provides beauty at the same time, an identity, sense of place. The other thing is, you know, the Featherston's response in the 1960s grants particularly to the expansion of the public sector and the need for heavy duty um, but very stylish metal furniture, contract furniture for universities, for this public sphere. You know, lecture theatre um, seating and tablets at Monash University, the human need of what, of which was that students were able to be able to stand on the top of the tablets, you know, the, the, student rights and uprisings of that era. Okay, the, and it, then with the expo chair, and we haven't got it here, and I'll, give, I'll change your picture. There, the expo chair. The need for the visitors to the Montreal 67 um, expo they, to relieve their feet, their weary feet, to overcome the fatigue while sitting down and listening to a recording about Australian way of life. So that's the type of human need we're talking about. In the 1970s, the Featherstons also started to look at you know, design for disabilities, design for marginal groups, and the marginal groups at that time included children, children and learning in which to Mary's work has gone. So this was not an easy path to take. Behind the beautiful furniture, the sketches, photography, models, um, experimental work that we have on display, there is a story of the Featherston struggle to sustain a design practice dedicated to innovation and social value. Grant and Mary were tireless campaigners for design standards other than profit in the face of the manufacturing and retail industries that were dedicated to pirating and copying and using overseas licences. And with this, they had an in, you know, inbred dislike or hostility to research and development and original designs. Grants even uh, opposed the establishment of the interior, sorry, of the Industrial Design Council of Australia on the basis that its overriding big business interests uh, would, as he rightly suspected, replace the ideal of social value with the ideal of design for profit, which it, it does do. And while the mainstay of design and manufacturing industries found Grant pesky, because he was always out berating them about change and trying to get them to change, and while they, you know, as I said, wanted to dismiss him, 
Um, they couldn't. You know, they dismissed him with things like he was ahead of his time, he was uh, ahead of the technology, he was not pragmatic enough, he was naive. Um, and these all, are, if you unpack them, are all ways of saying we want you to be quiet and go with it, so to speak. But the, those accusations, when we look at the body of the work, which is on display at Heidi, um, that body of work is unrivaled, unrivaled in its innovation, and it's gobsmackingly successful. In, at Heidi, we had the Aristox um, furniture, which I haven't got an image, I don't think. Have I? No. no. So I won't go there. But that... that <laughs> There we go. Okay. So, oh, and um, space as well. Um, so, you know, so what I'm trying to say there is that while, you know, while the industry were doing this and trying to say that he was impractical, on another level, he wasn't. He built three, four businesses in his lifetime that made a lot of money for other people. Um, they were, he was not naive. The Featherstons were not naive. Rather, Grant would say... They were curious. They were interested. They were about discovery. Um, and that you had to be naive to be open to opportunities, invention and innovation and to be alive to the world in which we live. Um, the visitors to the exhibition were also, uh, also discovering that Featherstone's chairs are never just commodities. They are discursive objects. They are a response to change, social change, gender change, family, education, work, technology, materials. Um, and their ability to capture and express, uh, to capture the public ima imagination, still to do it is really impressive. There's a quality in it because of this engagement with people that really, really works. Okay. Also within the exhibition, what you get is seven decades. When we put Grant's um, career, which starts in 1938, together with Mary's, which is still going, we've got at least seven decades of the... Um, sorry. Of, um, that encompasses a history of social and cultural change and manufacturing change in Australia. And with the... With this, the centrality of design, um, the way it shapes our everyday lives, our homes, our workplaces, our leisure zones, um, you know, places such as municipal offices, as I said, universities, schools, daycare, um, and experiences like museum experiences, like the NGV that is at the moment um, celebrating, you know, the 50 years since it opened, Broy Grounds building opened, and it was, you know, the fit out, the original fit out and furnishings was done by the Featherstons. So within Featherstons design and within the exhibition, I think um, there is a, a, a social story and there's a design story from which there are many um, lessons that we can have. Uh, and Looking at the people going to the exhibition, what is fascinating is how they connect and how they all in some way have been touched by Featherston design, whether it's the chair that their um, grandmother has, everybody knows the Delmont chair, and I haven't got a picture of it, but you all know it, you've all sat on one, so to speak. So the other thing that we show within the exhibition is that for the Featherstons, they were always linking their design to nature. It was ground in nature. Their ideal of functional design is as in nature. Um, and that is, I think, really important as we get further and further through digital technology, etc., as we're getting further and further and distant from our natural environments. The next question that they asked me was, what aspects of mid-century design practice do I see as pointing the way to how contemporary design can respond to social and technological change and contribute to improving people's lives in the 21st century? I think the first thing I would want to say is how the thing, how do we respond to change? There's a great deal to be learned about 
whether we respond to change openly, excitedly, inventively, bravely, um, or, or do we play it safe and hinder change? And this was a battle that the Featherstons fought all the time. Whether um, you in the, uh, whether to withdraw into the nostalgia and stay safe, as manufacturers did in the 1960s and 70s by pursuing the Danish style of design, which we all love and is a deep part of our heritage. But in the same time, they were uh, depleting the uh, exotic timbers of the world and it's something that we never actually look at. They seem to be, it seems to be good design. Okay, but so do we do that and do it um, retreat into something that is safe and known or, like the Featherstons, grab hold of the new and the technological and explore it? And that was, with, starting with the expo chair, plastics, and you can see the plastics along there as well. And, I mean, today plastics is very, very controversial. But the notion with plastics, as Featherston said, was don't just take it to produce the proliferation of objects, useless objects, basically. Look at it. Explore that material. Explore the technologies that go with it and see if you can, what you can do with it. Can you produce, you know, plastics provided a way to use absolutely minimal material, reduce labour in being able to produce a single piece out of a, a mould. So what we've got there is a one-piece chair, one piece in the middle, sorry, one piece with a cover. So you're simplifying it down, that reduces the cost, and then it becomes affordable for all. And at the same time, you're exploring design from cradle to grave, you're exploring ideas of um, sustainability, recycling, etc. What could be really done positively with plastics in those ways? The other thing is design for human need. The Featherstone's design, as I said, was based in human needs, and I think Mary will take you into more of this. But it begins with the user. And as I was preparing for this, I heard a program on the ABC about um, access, design for disabilities, access, technological design, digital design, for um, inclusive design, actually, is what it was. And they were saying, you cannot design for us unless you talk to us, unless you come and find out what my needs as a blind person is, what my needs as a hearing imper in, um, impaired person is. And they were very clear about that. Don't come to me at the end. Come to me. Come to us at the beginning. And also when you're doing this, think about what you do for us in terms of how it creates an inclusive language that includes all people at the same time. It was really interesting. The Centre for Inclusive Design in Sydney also was saying you need to do design from the needs, as I said, from needs from talking. But she also interestingly said that design needed to be beautiful because if you are disabled, you are struggling all the time with the um, technologies and with the world. And if you make it beautiful, if you make it functional, then it creates that ease that we were talking about. And that's where I'm going to finish. I'm sorry about the microphone. Um, I'm feeling famous. So I guess why do we care as a group of architects about the future of housing? You know, should we just sit and wait for um, our clients to call us? So currently architects design 3% of housing in the country and that 3% is for the most entitled. Uh, we've got a population problem. So Melbourne's essentially growing at about 100,000 new Melburnians year on year and generally the way that we deal with it is that we... We've stopped turning to the state and we rely on private property development. And that's either volume builders or uh, apartment builders. And the way that they approach property development, in my experience as an architect, is it's about delivering product for profit. 
It's not about delivering housing. It's not about delivering communities. It's about profit. The byproduct of that is housing. Both of these images are images of Melbourne, the same city. Um, and we know that Robin Boyd wrote a book over half a century ago which talked about the Australian ugliness and warned us about urban sprawl. Yet our go-to for housing affordability today is still building at the city's edges. Rob Adams and the city design team um, at the city of Melbourne looked at Melbourne and the problem of sprawl um, and then built, built a, a piece of work around um, postcode 3000 and what could the future of Melbourne look like. And they looked at other cities that dealt with um, densification at kind of six to eight storeys. So they looked at Rome, Barcelona, Paris, Amsterdam, even New York, and historically, the city of Melbourne. So Melbourne used to be a set of villages that were, that were largely walkable. They were linked by trains or trams um, and that people would live and work in those same places. In 2007, some of you may remember the Kevin 07 election. So for me, practising as a sustainable architect, uh, it seemed like for the first time in a very long time that uh, there was hope. Um, the local polling booth in Brunswick voted over 30% to the Greens and it seemed that the time was right that everyone was talking about a price on carbon and it seemed like uh, the year before John Howard had finally admitted that climate change was real and we just suffered a massive drought leading up to 2006. So um, uh, my company, Breathe Architecture, and six other architects bought a site in Brunswick next to a train station. And we thought that we would try and deliver at a granular level what Rob Adams had been talking about at a city scale. We thought we would build a building that was kind of about six storeys tall, that was close to public transport, next to the upfield bike path, next to the Anstey train station, next to the number 19 tram, next to the 503 bus. And we thought that we would build, like the Europeans would, a building that was about people, and not about cars. The idea was that we would do, do something that seemed impossible in the current development model, which was we would build something that was both sustainable and affordable simultaneously, and that we would sell it to owner occupiers, not to offshore investors. Our approach to sustainability was one of reductionism. The idea, the simple mantra for Bonnie Herring, our project architect through the entire project was build less, give more question everything. If we don't need it, we don't build it. So <laughs> my personal favourite, we took out the basement car park. Why is this important? From an operational cost, the average cost of running a house in Australia is about $11,500 after tax. So that's according to the ABS, which includes depreciation, insurance, registration, maintenance, fuel. Um, to build a basement car park in an old industrial site in Brunswick on this site cost about $750,000. So we took that out and used that $750,000 to increase, the, to buy the best double glazing that we could buy, to build the best rooftop garden that we could. And then where there should have been um, a roller door and a driveway over the footpath, instead we put in a wine shop. <laughs> and so we already saved $750,000 from not putting the cars in and then we sold the wine shop for $425,000. So the simple move of not putting in the cars saved, saved the, the project about, you know, over $1.1 million. Reduced everyone's apartment by about $35,000. We put in the highest ratio of bikes to apartments in the country. And whenever you need a bottle of wine, all you have to do is go downstairs. <laughs> um, we took out all the individual laundries. So um, instead of uh, taking up two square metres of everyone's living space, we put six um, industrial washing machines on the roof and they look out over the rooftop garden and have a city view. This is strangely, this little utilitarian room up here has become the kind of social glue that binds the commons. It's the place where everyone comes together to do simple tasks and it doesn't matter whether you're an architect or a teacher or a CEO, this is where you do your washing and it's an opportunity to meet your neighbours. And this is where I've met lots of introverts in the Commons. I live in this building. My wife agreed to live there with me for 18 months. We've been there four and a half years and we've collected lots of data on our neighbours. Um, <laughs> the other thing about the laundry was that it saved everyone um, about $5,000 off the price of their apartment. And then it saved, it saved the building from buying 24 washing machines and instead there's only five, or there's only six. And that's, that's paid for through your owner's corporation fees. And if one ever breaks down, someone comes and fix it. So there's never actually a maintenance problem. 
We took out the air conditioning and we only did this after we used the money that we saved from the car park to increase our double glazing, uh, to increase the wall thicknesses in our insulation, to increase the thickness of our insulation on our roof. We got the building rating added over seven and a half stars and our thermal modelling said that the building would operate between 19 and 27 degrees. In Australia, apparently, we can only operate between 19 and 23 degrees. But in Germany, they can operate between 19 and 27 degrees. We thought that the Germans might be right in this occasion. And so we accepted that broader thermal comfort range and we spoke to our, res our future residents about that. Um, so I've lived in here um, and uh, I've lived through some heat waves in Brunswick, which are absolutely horrendous, without air conditioning. I've got ceiling sweep fans, which basically give us a cooling coefficient of three to four degrees on the skin. So if it's 27 degrees in my apartment, um, it feels like it's 23 or 24 where I'm sitting. Um, it's very comfortable. Particularly in Brunswick, which has all old power infrastructure. So whenever there's a heat wave in Brunswick, the power grid goes out. So everyone who's sitting in their poorly designed, poorly orientated, poorly insulated apartments, relying on air conditioning to keep cool, are all down at Barclay Square or Sparkly Bear, as it's uh, colloquially known in Brunswick, trying to keep cool. But the aircon doesn't work at Barclay Square when the power's out either, of course. Um, we take out all the plasterboard ceilings throughout the entire building and instead our ceiling heights jump from 2.7 to 2.9 and of course all the hot air in summer sits at the top. The apartments are cross-ventilated so um, in summer as the nighttime temperatures come in and it cools, we open the buildings up and the air moves across the concrete and it resets that concrete, cools it down ready for the next day. It's basically using concrete as thermal lag, using time to be able to mediate or take out the peaks of daytime temperatures and the troughs of nighttime temperatures. We take out all the chrome and the ceramic tiles. I won't give you the long version about the problem with uh, ceramic tiles and the embodied energy uh, and the issue with those and the maintenance issues with tiles. But I, I will say, um, if anyone meets an old chrome plate, can you let me know? Because we're yet to find one. Um, when we sold the commons, um, we tried to find owner-occupiers and 22 of 24 of the apartments were bought by owner-occupiers. Bernie actually knows one of the only uh, renters that was in the original building. Um, and so what that meant was the intent was to have a more stable community, a community that would be there for long enough to actually build relationships. Um, data out of the City of Melbourne says that the average tenure in a one-bedroom apartment in the City of Melbourne is 11 months. So you know when you're seeing moving trucks out the front of the city, in, in, at the front of apartment buildings, it's because people can't even bear to stay in those apartments for their 12 month shitty lease. We communicate with each other really simply. So there's a blackboard downstairs, there's a Facebook group, there's a WhatsApp group, and we talk to each other. There's rooftop gardens where people can come together and um, plant lots of kale. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so there needs to be more coordination about what you plant, we've learnt, because in year one, everyone planted kale. It was kale overdose. Um, we don't have clothes dryers, but we have um, clothes lines. And again, like the, like the laundry, it's a really simple idea, an opportunity for people to come together, doing simple things that you need to do in everyday life. Give you an opportunity to talk to each other. Rather than having air conditioning, we have these vegetated light courts with these misting systems in there. So then in the middle of the building, there's these ferneries, um, which Mary, you might like. Um, so everyone looks out onto the ferneries and then as the misting kicks in, it cools the air by about four degrees in there. Um, the apartments are simple. It says in the owner's corporation rules not to hang anything off any of the fire services. This is uh, Ben and Georgia. They don't read the owner's corporation rules. Um, obviously, this is their apartment. Really, really simple. So. Um, the, the joinery is made from form ply. Form ply is a plastic face plywood which is used to form up concrete. It's really robust, it's totally imperfect, it's not meant to be made for furniture. But the thing is it's really tough and you can cut holes out of it and use the reduction in that to work as a handle rather than buying a handle, producing that handle and then screwing it on rather than addition. In 2014, this building won the National Award for Sustainability and the National Award for Housing. And I think that the interesting thing for um, Bonnie in my office uh, was that the Commons was arrived at through um, incredible precedent research. So she just looked at precedents all around the world in Copenhagen, in Berlin, and applied all of those principles here. So nothing that you see at the Commons is groundbreaking. It's just well-researched design um, applied here. And so, I guess what shocked Bonnie and I was that 
this building won the National Award for Housing and National Award for Sustainability. So in 2014, theoretically, this is the best building Australia has to offer. It's a $7.1 million building in Brunswick between a panel beater and a train station. Um, it was up against um, one central park in Sydney designed by the French architect Jean Nouvel. It's got a $3 million piece of artwork that hangs off the top and redirects light down into the light court. It's an incredible building. And when I said to the jury chair, how could this building have possibly beat Jean Nouvel's building, he said the residents of the Commons seemed happy. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> what we learned out of the whole process was that to actually deliver a good, a good outcome, it wasn't in design, not in the traditional sense. It wasn't in the architecture. It wasn't in the built form. It was actually in setting the goalposts, deciding what it was we wanted to achieve at the outset, um, and that's what we aimed to do. It had to be a triple bottom line development, and we wanted to do that again. We decided that the only way to do that was to democratise the capital, to take the money away from the people that's currently delivering housing in the city. So, you know, um, public list development companies. Um, some of our clients as architects might be ex-plastics manufacturers or ex-bankers um, or ex-real estate agents. And so instead, we built this thing called Nightingale. And the idea was that we would democratise the capital have 25 shareholders putting up $100,000 each mortgaged against their homes, who cared enough about the city that we could pay them a fair and reasonable return on their money, but they would also care enough about the actual outcome, and that we would take direction instead, the architect would take direction from the residents that would live there at the end, rather than people putting in the money. Sounds too good to be true. We wanted to make sure it was replicable and scalable. Um, and when we started, we had a wait list of 11 people that had emailed us uh, at the end of the Commons. Uh, that wait list is now um, just over 6,000 people. We've completed one building with 20 apartments, and we've got three under construction. Um, and I'll take you through some of those. But fundamentally, um, Nightingale is about taking out all the middlemen. So if you look at this, the, the bottom line through here is the Nightingale model. The top line is a, is a standard development model. So we buy our land at the same price as a developer does. We pay our consultants and our architects the same as a developer does. We don't employ a marketing team. We don't build a display suite. Instead, we take them through our previous work as architects. We don't employ a real estate agent, my personal favourite. Um, <laughs> and we build our apartments about the same price that a developer does, but we don't have a basement um, and air conditioning on every balconies, but instead we have the best double glazing money can buy. Um, and we have a beautiful rooftop garden. Um, and then lastly, we cap the profit or the cost of the project at what we're buying that money from. So whatever it costs us for that equity that we're paying all those investors for, that's how much the project costs. And we show all those costs to our residents transparently. That's meant to be transparent, but I'm sorry, it's <laughs> a little bit hard to read at the back there. Um, we have a restrictive covenant which says if we sell you an apartment that's $100,000 under market, that you can resell it at the price that you paid for it, plus the indexing of the suburb that you bought it in. Because we're not in the, we, we, don't, we don't want to build housing as an asset class, we want to build housing as a place to live. Um, all of our buildings are carbon neutral, so we had to build our own in <laughs> had to build our own energy company to make this happen because, it, as it turns out, every embedded network company wants to insert themselves as middlemen between you and the power company to take the margin. So essentially, we took out the middlemen on that as well. Did a deal with Taz Hydro. So we buy carbon neutral power from Taz Hydro at about 19 cents a kilowatt hour and we sell it to the residents at Nightingale One at 19 cents a kilowatt hour. Easy. Everyone across the road is paying 28 cents a kilowatt hour for black power. Our residents get cheaper power, but with no carbon emissions. So the average cost of a two bedroom apartment in Nightingale One to run that is about $1.07 a day. It's Nightingale One, again, next to the train. It's opposite the commons. These are some residents. So once a month, we would take the resident group through the building as it would be built so they could meet the foreman, meet the plumber, meet the electrician, ask questions, understand how their home is being built, and importantly, build community with their neighbours through that build process. There's a sense of urban generosity that we open the building up during the day. So the cafe downstairs opens it up at 6am and the architects downstairs close the building up at 6pm. And in the middle, there are toilets, essentially public toilets people can use. Um, there's no glass on the stairs, but it looks out into some fernery, of course. <laughs> um, 
there's no ceilings, and in some instances there's no wall linings. So it does look like a concrete bunker with some recycled timber floors. It's light on materials, um, um, but it's simple and it's elegant and it's robust and it's tough. It's the rooftop on Nightingale One. And these are the residents of the Commons in Nightingale One when the building was finished, taking all their rooftop furniture down, bringing it out into the street, closing the street with some witches' hats and having an impromptu lunch when the sun was out on one Sunday. This is Nightingale Two by Six Degrees. They're leading the second project. Nightingale Three by Austin Maynard Architects, leading the third Nightingale project. This is Nightingale Brunswick East by Clark Hopkins Clark and Breathe Architecture. Nightingale Village in Brunswick, two streets south of Nightingale. So seven, seven architects, seven buildings, seven com communities, all carbon neutral with 20% affordable housing. I was saying before, the fascinating thing about um, any other city, so if we were building housing in New York or London, there would be a requirement that 20% of our housing was affordable housing. In Melbourne, there's no requirement for an affordable housing component. Any property developer can build any housing development with no proportion of affordable housing. So we thought that we would set the, the, this benchmark straight. So currently in Fisherman's Bend, the aspirational affordable housing target is 6%. And the important thing to note in that is that the term aspirational, what that actually means is that the property developers will say it's too expensive, it doesn't work, and there'll be zero affordable housing put into Fisherman's Bend or definitely less than 6%. So we're going to deliver 20% affordable housing at Nightingale Village because we want to. And then Nightingale Housing was established to take all of the IP from all of these architects, all of these projects, and share them with every other great architect in this country and try and proliferate this idea. Thank you. Well, today... Um Fortunately, Denise has said a lot about furniture, so I hope you will forgive me for putting that to one side for now. Um, and the focus of this symposium is uh, design for social change. Now, for me, as, a, as Denise describes, a, as a, a humanist, modernist designer, um, in my case, this has been uh, a 50-year um, pursuit uh, of using whatever design skills I have to try and radically transform school education. Why? Why would anybody um, pursue such a maybe unachievable goal? Um, and it really comes back to two central beliefs that I have and, I, and Grant certainly shared them as well. Um, the first is about children and learning. And I've come to the belief, belief that uh, schools underestimate children's capabilities. They underestimate their uh, curiosity. They underestimate their creativity. And furthermore, they misunderstand the ways in which children like to learn. So. You can see this is uh, a passion that's driven me for, for five decades. Now, the other belief, which is essentially connected to the first, is a belief in design, the power of design. Um, I believe that, that design, particularly thoughtful design, has the... Um, it influences how we feel how we do things, what we can do. It makes certain experiences possible, even pleasurable, um, or not. It, it is, it, it's a very powerful uh, tool. So I've tried to bring these two things together. I'm not an educator, and so what I've tried to do is to say, well, how can I help those who want to change things um, using whatever skills I, I've got? So I want to just briefly today talk to you about two projects, um, both of which bring together this drive for, for changing school education together with, with design of the physical environment. And in both cases, um, children, young people, 
were deeply engaged in the whole consultative process. So they were involved in um, creating something and then subsequently engaged as users of the design. So the first, um, which is, has been mentioned, is the Children's Museum. Uh, now this goes back um, 30 years uh, when the museum was in the old building in Swanson Street before the gallery had moved down the road to St Kilda Road. And um, it's going to be very hard for younger people in the audience to believe this, but 40 years ago, um, galleries and museums were really hostile places to take children. Some of you will remember. So sitting out as a young parent to visit the, um, the esteemed National Gallery or the museum um, was, was difficult. It was, um, it was almost a punitive environment. It was hands off. Uh, everything was behind glass. Uh, there were lots of please don't touch notices. The, the, the guards, not the community, what are they? Customer services officers, but the guards were in military uniforms. And um, the, the, <laughs> the environment was extremely quiet. So it's not, you know, in every way it was not hospitable to children. But, you know, when you think about it, those institutions are the repositories of the treasures of our culture. They are vital, uh, vital places for all of us to visit and appreciate, and particularly for young people to build up a, um, a happy connection with, which, you know, nowadays they can. But as I say, in those days it was extremely difficult, different. And so a number of us um, got together and thought, you know, what can we do about this? Well, we need perhaps to try and set up a children's museum. And I'd been doing a lot of reading about what was happening in particular in North America and in Scandinavia, and there were exciting things happening. So I thought, well... Um, you know, let's lobby. So we did. We lobbied the government, Ministry for the Arts and the museum. We tried the gallery, but that um, <laughs> drew a blank at that point. Um, but eventually, we were given uh, some funding by the government and a, a beautiful space in the, the old um, museum building in Swanton Street. And... Um, so the, the, the new director of the Children's Museum, Rachel Faggeter, and myself said, so now what are we going to do? We've got this space. What are we going to do? Well, we thought it would be a good idea to present a series of thematic, highly interactive exhibitions. Um, and the Minister, the Minister for the Arts said he wanted to open it at a particular time, which was like seven months away. It was like no time at all. Um, but we decided that, yep, we would... We would go for the highly interactive exhibition, and that, you know, what would be a good first theme? Well, we thought maybe the human body was a pretty good place to start because we've all got one and not much of us know much about it. So um, we set out. Even though we had very little time, I thought it was absolutely essential that we go first to children before we did anything. We must consult with children and ask them what they would like in an exhibition about the human body. It was a revelation. And it's, it really propelled me on this course, and here I am, you know, decades later. Um, so how to go about it in a way that was authentic and not just a token consultation with children, which happens a great deal. Some of you may be aware. Um, so what I did was to ask a few teacher friends if they would... Um, give me access to a small group of children, so no more than six, for half an hour or so, and, in, and set it up informally, not in a classroom, but just around a table, as informal as possible. And I would come along with a tape recorder and I'd just say to them, look, I'm from the Children's Museum and we're going to do an exhibition about the human body. What would you like to see? And I didn't know what was going to happen. I had no... you know. God, I hope this works. It was phenomenal. The kids were just so full of ideas. They had such vivid life experiences that they could immediately call to mind. 
Um, they knew exactly what they wanted. And this is going from uh, six-year-olds to 16. I did various groups. But they also knew what they didn't want, and I'll come back <clears throat> more on that later. Um, so what did they ask for, and how did that affect the final design of the exhibits? <clears throat> there were many exhibits in this exhibition, and it was incredibly successful, but I'd always have to follow that by saying there was no competition at the time. Nothing else. So we had, I think it was something like 300,000 visitors in the first year, it was because there was no competition. What did the children ask for? I'll give you three examples, which I think are quite telling. Um, one of the questions was, what happens after you eat your food, after you swallow your food? And they'd say, you know, like, what happens when you can't see it inside before it turns into poo? And then they had... Um, and that was... I mean, these the, the three questions I'm going to... Uh, three areas that I'll tell you about were common across all the age groups. So... Um, Yes, yeah, so, so what happens? And then they had ideas about how you could interpret this. But the younger children wanted it full size so that you could actually crawl through it and you know, all sorts of ideas which um, were going to be quite costly. Um, but Rachel and I said, look, the thing about doing things in the museum is that it is regarded by the community as a source of really authoritative information. So we felt we could be a bit serious about how we did this. Maybe we didn't have to have kids crawling through food tubes. Um, but rather, I went up to the um, anatomy department at Melbourne University and I said, look, the kids um, want to know about food. Um, how do we do this? And so they pulled out a real food tube out of a stainless steel tank, spread it out across the bench. I got Peter Corlett, one of our... Um, fine realist design, uh, sculptors to come and actually model it in, in fibreglass. So another thing I say about um, exhibition design is that, interactive exhibition design, is that it, it's, it's got f fantastic potential. You can do all sorts of things. You can use sound, you can use all the senses. Um, and so we also went to uh, one of our top uh, sound designers and said, you know, how can we draw people into this? And he uh, he developed some sounds with a bit of poetic license about sounds of digestion. And there was a wonderful um, slogan that used to be used in museology, I don't know whether it still is, that um, it's about streakers, strollers and students. So visitors come into a museum and they're on the move. You know, they're walking through, walking through. You've got to grab them, try and slow them down and turn them into strollers. And the king hit is if you turn them into students, which means they've really slowed down and they stop and they're really talking about things and asking questions. That's, that's the key, you know. That, and we sort of did manage that sometimes. Um, so we're using... Um, it, the, the Grant used to talk about the sausage and the sizzle. He said, first of all, get the sizzle right. So the sizzle is the, the thing that you use to attract people, the novelty, humour, whatever. Um, and so seeing this food tube, which authentically is eight metres long, you know, spread out along the wall, and hearing the sounds was a great attraction. And then people started to look at it and say, oh, so that's what happens. You know, this is the way the food's broken down and this is the poo on the end. One of the things that kids absolutely did not want was to know anything about the five food groups. <laughs> or how to clean your teeth. That was it. You know, you could, you know. So we thought, oh God, you know, the funding was coming from the newly formed Health Promotion Authority. <laughs> so how to reconcile this? And again, we said, we'll do it seriously. And so I'd heard that there was a, um, a biology lecturer, she might have been, even been at Swinburne University, who was writing a program about um, uh, 
energy balance, you know, the thing about, that everybody knows about now, about you need to balance the amount of food intake, energy intake, with your, with your energy outtake in exercise. And so she had developed this wonderful program with, um, that was about the uh, energy value of different foods and how much exercise or different kinds of exercise you could do on the, um, on the food value. So it seemed very serious. And as you can see, the computers in 1985 were Apple green screen or Apple IIe green screens, so very primitive. And I also had the reservation. I thought, oh, this is going to, you know, stuff up the exhibition because people will just, because of the novelty, it'll just get jammed up with people. But in fact, it was, we had two of them operating the same program. And it was fantastic because the people uh, of all ages would gather around and talk about the content of the program. So it was, it was a good one. And as you can see, it was used by all ages. You, know, you can see adolescent boys. If you, God, if you can get adolescent boys to engage with anything, you've succeeded. Um, it was subsequently, the whole exhibition became a travelling exhibition and we took it to regional Victoria and we redesigned it. And when we put in a new exhibit called a step-up exhibit, so this was demonstrating the same thing, but in this case... Um, you can see the red apple that's made up of a hundred little red LEDs, and the, um, there's a pressure uh, pad under that step. So the idea is that the visitor weighs themselves and programs that in to the the um, black box, and it'll tell you how many step ups you could do on the energy contained on in one apple. And um, we'd got somebody lined up to build this thing. But we were running out of money. And I can remember one day I said to Grant, do you think we could just wire up 50 LEDs? Because nobody's going to do 1,500 step-ups. And he, you know, being ever sensible, said, of course not. You know, of course you can't. You've got to do it properly. Everything had to be done properly. Um, so we had to wire them all up. And in fact, of course, on the first day, the first kid does 1,500 step-ups. <laughs> so... What's another thing they asked for? Um, oh, they all wanted to see real organs. Real. And I said, you mean real? Yes. You know, when they cut open bodies and take things out, that's what they wanted to see. What does the heart really look like? And what do lungs really look like? Yeah, they, but oh, the other thing they didn't want was anything to do with smoking. You know, they don't, we didn't want... Don't tell us we can't smoke. And then a few minutes later they'd say, but we want to see, you know, we want to see lungs that have been, you know, somebody who died from smoking. We want to see what they look like, you know, black and oozy. Um, so then I had to go back to the anatomy department and say, this is what the kids want. Um, we had to get a special licence to show human tissue. It, well, it was such an issue. But anyway... Um, they're incredibly instructive. You don't need words. You just put that there and people will find out so much information. Um, I'd seen in a German magazine uh, the lung cast. Um, I wanted to show what... At the, air, that the lungs are mostly air. You know, how do you show that? Um, so I asked the preparators at the museum if they could do this. And it took them months, but just before we opened, they brought in this beautiful object. You know, it looks like a carved ivory, but it's actually where they put resin into the lungs of a sheep, um, sheep being very similar to a human body. Um, and then we had a torso. This is an off-the-shelf model that you can get, uh, life-size anatomical torso, and you can take all the organs out. And that's wonderful because it's like a three-dimensional jigsaw. And that, you know, kids would play with that endlessly. Um, now, the other thing they wanted, all of them, and this was the most surprising to me in a, you know, 1985 permissive age, they all wanted to know what the body really looks like on the outside without any clothes. And I said, you mean no clothes? Yes, no clothes. Um, and one of the teachers, I remember with a, 16, a group of 16-year-olds, one of the teachers said, 
and asked one of the, the boys who... It was always the boys who were most articulate. It's another whole story I could tell you about. But boys were very articulate and imaginative. And the teacher said to this kid, do you mean with genitalia? <laughs> and he looked at her witheringly and said, oh, when was the last time you, you saw a naked body without genitals? <laughs> So I went to Peter Corlett and he, um, thank God, he, at that point in life, was struggling to make any money and he, so he had to do carpentry and bricklaying and he, he was overjoyed to have a commission to actually produce bodies. Um, he did a wonderful job. And that's another whole story in itself, how he interpreted that. It's fabulous. Um, but the thing is, they're fibreglass. And so what we wanted was that they would be hands-on, that... that, that that they'd that they be authentic and that, that people could han uh, handle them endlessly and that's exactly what happened. What did we find out of this? We've, it confirmed the view that um, children are immensely curious and imaginative. Uh, we also learnt that there was no reference in any of these sessions, the consultative sessions, to um, formal school work. None. What this said to me was, or, you know, it, it, this raised a question in my mind, then why is school so different? Why, if what we're seeing is children so deeply engaged in this process of co-creation and so deeply engaged as visitors in the exhibition, what is happening here that, and why is that not informing school education? So very quickly, I then went on to... Um, over the, the last few years to, to work alongside um, courageous, remarkable educators, school principals, leadership, school communities across all ages to rethink um, how we might design schools. So just very quickly, this is uh, one of the seminal projects. This goes back 15, 20 years and it's a little school in, in Dandenong, Rana Park Primary School. Uh, a highly disadvantaged school, 45 different nationalities. Uh, we got a little bit of money from the department to have an action research project. Uh, and so here's the group of uh, years five and six kids. There's 100 or so kids with four or five teachers. Um, the school had already spent um, 10, 20 years investigating innovative uh, programs in other parts of the world and Australia. They'd made some changes, but then they ran up against the problem that the physical environment was not supporting what they wanted to do. So that's the point at which they asked me to come along. Um, this beautiful panel was, was done by a, a PhD candidate, Kelly Frith, who was at Swinburne, um, and it was to document the contents of one of their long-term inquiry projects. So the thing that, that um, distinguishes this way of working is that um, the children are involved in long-term inquiry projects that can go on for weeks, months, um, and take children deeper and deeper into a subject, things that the kids are interested in. So they're learning uh, the knowledge and skills along the way. Um, how did we involve... Uh, children as well as the educators. In this case, uh, we, they first of all spent some weeks exploring what is design, who does it, what's, the, what's its potential, um, and then we uh, got into analysing what they're actually doing. So I suggested to the kids that they um, think about each of the experiences they have in this new way of working and put that on... Uh, individual cards and then we put the cards on the wall and covered the wall with the, um, this information. Then we started rationalising it, analysing it. won't go into detail. Um, oh, this is documentation of the, the process, the, some of the children's drawings. They produced wonderful drawings and discussions and models. Uh, we took them on little excursions because they, they, some of the kids had very limited backgrounds, so we took them to... Um, out of studios to the ABC recording uh, studios, uh, to a furniture factory, all sorts of places. I won't go into details here, but we 
we ended up with um, a vocabulary of about uh, 14 or 15 different settings which then came together in the neighbourhoods. So just to round it up, did this create social change? No. What it has done is to cause um, a great deal of interest in design of schools. So you might be aware that there are many innovative environments in schools now. Uh, they're not well designed, they're open plan. Teachers are having a hell of a job trying to work in them. Um, they look different. People say, oh, this is very innovative. But if you analyse the children's experience, it's pretty much the same as it was in a traditional classroom. So at my advanced age, I can't quite give it up. I still keep thinking it's worth fighting for. And if any of you do, <laughs> please join the battle. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it's, it's lovely to be here. So I'm going to jump in I'm, I, and, and make this quick so we can get on to, I'm sure people would like to enjoy hearing, hearing a panel conversation. Um, I've got a, a series of projects that I'm going to run through which are trying to respond to the questions. But first of all, on the topic of social impact, I think it's very important that we understand that all design has a social impact. And um, most of it is bad, generally. Uh, so um, so the, I, uh, to, to, to put that in context, I suppose, when I look at the, 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 uh, the period when, um, when Grat and Mary um, uh, were in practice together, we look at that period um, of, uh, I, I suppose, optimism about the role of design, democratising design, democratising access to, to, um, to good housing, to um, affordable, high-quality products. Um, I mean, that happened, there was a period that happened globally um, and probably kicked off after World War II, probably um, instigated in places like Italy and other and Scandinavian countries. But I suppose if we, if we think backwards now, what, what has happened is that design predominantly, whether that's architecture or product design, has really be, been co-opted by industry to be, so designers predominantly work as an instrument of industry um, and industry um, is, is designed prim primarily to make money and to make money for private individuals, not for... So I'm not a, I, I'm not, um, I don't have a problem with people making money. I don't have a problem with designers doing that. But I think it's very important that we understand that that is the context that we operate in. Um, and the idea that you can change the world or improve things now by designing a low-cost chair is probably um, impossible because the, that post-war period and the period through the 60s and 70s did result in um, companies that have emerged that can produce at, at huge quantity things that are very high quality and that um, are very accessible. So I'm very interested in the idea that some of the common questions that designers repeatedly try and answer, like how do we design another um, sustainable chair or a, or, a, or a piece of sustainable packaging or another brand, those questions have been answered many, many times. And the iterative benefit that you get um, is very small. So this is sort of incremental change. Um, now, we collect some of that work and we commission and, and uh, exhibitions about that, but my personal interest is really... Um, uh, I think, uh, uh, in common with, with Mary and Jer Jeremy, this sense of um, something that is um, repeatable, scalable. I like ideas that are, have impact, can scale, and 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 can be can be implemented, which is which is one of the most important things. So these are some of those ideas, and these are just a set of projects that I I am um, I think uh, enunciate different areas that designers are working in. All right, Leah, hi. So Leah's an RMIT um, educator. Um, 
and why I'm showing this product fa facet is um, I think it's uh, it's very interesting for us to consider for people who are differently abled, for people who have um, ha have a different ac uh, accessible um, uh, situation, people with hearing impairments, people with with physical disabilities. Um, why should the products that they have not be the most the, the, the best design products, why should they not have things, things that are technically um, innovative but also beautiful? And um, the FACET, which has won Australian Design Award, is sort of um, bringing that kind of idea of jewellery design, of the ornamentation of jewellery to, to a hearing aid device. And um, for me, what, what, why I pull up this example is because the social impact of that is is to remove stigma from from um, the idea of, of the product and actually to elevate the product. And we see that more and more in in prosthetics. Um, but interestingly, if we think of prosthetics, if you think of those really cool razor blade like prosthetic limbs that you see every now and then on athletes, the average prosthetic limb worn in America by an ex military serviceman costs 400,000 US dollars. This is the UNHCR, the United Nations Human Rights, have a standard prosthetic leg which is valued at about $2. Um, basically because no one is interested in designing um, uh, cheap prosthetic limbs because you don't make any money out of it. It means that every single person um, pretty much in Africa, um, Vietnam, Cambodia, um, um, developing countries um, who have the need for a prosthetic limb um, have to get one standard unit, which doesn't fit anybody because, of course, it's just standardised. So Peter V. Sin Lee, um, who's at Melbourne University, has designed a very low-cost way of using um, water swirling in a pipe that the person puts their, their limb in, um, a, parametric, a piece of parametric design software, um, uh, models that limb, and he can print um, in the field a very, very low-cost cup that goes inside the limb. Um, and the result of that cup is that the limb actually fits the person properly for the first time ever. Um, I find work like this very, very exciting. Um, he, he's actually a bioengineer and, and he didn't think that he was a designer. I said, no, can I please call you a designer? <laughs> because I want to be able to include your work in exhibitions. Um, clean water. Um, I think it's 200 and 50 million children suffer from um, severe illnesses each year um, due to the lack of clean drinking water um, in the world. You know, I mean, it's a fundamental um, human right, but still um, something that is um, a massive issue and is only going to get worse with um, um, scarce resources such as fresh water. Life Straw, this is actually an interesting product because it was originally designed for the developing world. Um, but it costs about $38 a unit and actually therefore is, um, while it is um, uh, a very impactful product which is uh, being designed to take pathogens out of dirty water, effectively you can drink water out of a puddle anywhere and, and it cleans it. Um, it's now become, if you look at the Life Straw website, it's actually now for people going backpacking and camping because it wasn't scalable in its market because of the cost, but it's still a fantastic product. Um, M-Pesa. So M-Pesa is a, uh, a piece of software that was developed by um, Vodafone with the British um, Foreign Aid um, Council. And what they were trying to do with this product is, is to stop... Um, so it's for people to transfer money. Most people in the world don't have a bank account. Um, 250 million people in India have never been on the internet. Um, but they still... There are people who, you know, if you think of um, the Philippines as a, cu a culture where people go all over the world and work uh, at low, for, for, for um, low wages but send um, some of that money back home. And PESA was developed to remove corruption and remove fees from that system. Um, so it's actually just a little app on a phone. Um, and, of course, what we see all across um, Africa, for example, is that they never went to landlines. Everybody just works on mobile phones. So the mobile phone um, and a connection to the internet um, is probably the greatest um, social impact that, that you can actually have, um, especially for, for women in developing countries, because there are products like M-Pesa. 
So this is the West Kimberley Indigenous Prison by Iridale Pedersen Hook. Um, and we think about, you know, I was trying to show different typologies, I suppose, of things. If we think about the work that architects can do, um, this is a prison for um, male inmates who are often a long way from their traditional lands, often um, have, uh, you know, sometimes only in prison because they haven't paid fines, but sometimes for violent crimes and other things. But why can we not design a prison that's culturally, um, culturally specific to people, to their lands, to try and address the terrible situation with, um, with um, self-harm um, in our prison system for Indigenous men in particular? Um, I mean, this, this prison uh, has a whole story, which I won't go into, but just that idea that architecture can, um, can move into um, many different spaces within our society. Portable, who are a um, software development company in Melbourne, they do interaction design, service design, um, and they've been working with the Justice Department looking at how they can design app-based systems, web platforms and other systems that improve access to the justice system. And what we see increasingly going on, um, in particular in develop developed countries, but more and more elsewhere, is the use of design process within public policy design within uh, to access um, um, services um, and uh, often... Uh, uh, looking at ways to make those um, accessible for people um, who, who normally struggle to do so. Royal Children's Hospital. Um, for anybody who has spent time in hospital with kids, unfortunately I've had the displeasure of doing that in my life, um, this building, to me, really illustrates... I mean, for me, it's a really powerful work of architecture because it totally transforms um, that experience, what is probably one of the most traumatic experiences that you can have in your life. Um, and when you look at the, um, the depth of thought and creativity that Bates Smart and the team put into this project, um, the public spaces, the sense of... Um, uh, of playfulness, but also um, uh, the way that they've used the, the wayfinding systems. It's a multi-layered pr um, project, um, really looking at how design can improve um, uh, that challenging scenario. I'm not going to talk about this project. I heard about it somewhere, but apparently it's good. <laughs> apparently it's good. I'm not so sure. Um, the Australian Islamic Centre by Glenn Merkett and Hakana Levely Beautiful idea to design a, a mosque right now in Australia where we, of course, there is the, um, uh, uh, the vilification of Islamic people in our community and in many communities around the world. Um, uh, the first contemporary Australian mosque, the first mosque with a transparent glass facade through which you can look at people praying. Um, uh, and what's beautiful about this project is that the community requested that that approach, you know, that for them they understood the power of architecture to transform the interpretation of their faith. The neighbourhood project, so co-design and the process of co-design itself, so this is a studio, but the idea of designers increasingly working with community, in, uh, working with user groups um, to co-design solutions. Um, and what's interesting about this project is, is the idea of creating a, uh, a methodology which can be deployed by people on their own. So this sense of co-designing something with, with a group, but then en enabling other groups to then customise and take that forward. Repair in Venice, architects on the international stage talking about the destruction of indigenous plant um, ecology through um, uh, peri-urban sprawl. I think it's very interesting when we see, um, uh, you know, this is the, the major opportunity for Australian architects to talk about what they do on an international stage. And I thought it was very beautiful that the, that the story that was told in Venice this year was um, about um, our lack of consideration, I suppose, for the natural world and, and for, for species that seem insignificant but, of course, have great cultural and um, ecological significance. Something I draw your attention to in the context of social design, I'm, I'm, I think we have a problem in Australia when we have so few Indigenous designers, so few registered Indigenous architects. Um, something I think is, 
for all um, academic institutions teaching design, for all institutions such as ours exhibiting and curating design, um, we really need to work much harder in providing um, incentive for um, Indigenous people to study design and to take the, bring their culture into, um, into the design and architecture conversation and not seen as something that always needs to be done in collaboration. I'd like to see more Indigenous-led design. And there's a couple of little projects. These are kind of exemplary, I suppose, of how we might use technology. I mean, certainly I think um, for those of you in the audience who are nervous of how digital technology, um, I suppose, takes away value or, or diminishes culture because people are absorbed in, in staring at Instagram constantly or looking at their phones, I think there are huge and profound opportunities in virtual reality, in, um, in AI, or, um, artificial intelligence and, and other um, forms of emerging technology um, in providing radical new kinds of um, health, education um, outcomes. I mean, for um, this is a, a, a tool that's designed um, in Melbourne for um, people suffering Alzheimer's um, to re-stimulate um, their, their brains with um, through storytelling, visual storytelling of, based on place and nature. So there are a set of projects which I suppose, for me, sum up a few examples of some of the great work that designers are doing. Um, for anybody here who is studying design or who is a designer, I think, um, I think there is a very, um, there's an ongoing question, I suppose, about um, how is it that designers move more into a social space, into a positive social space, and understand that um, every product that, or every brand that's designed, um, I mean, brands accelerate businesses, businesses um, create their own impacts. So the chain, the cycle of design is, um, is um, interlinked. Um, so designers, in a sense, are complicit in, in, in all of the different systems um, that we, we see around us. And um, some of them are fantastic systems, like I've pointed out, but also there are, are many systems that are not so fantastic. And I would hope that we um, could all work together to make them better. So thank you very much. And my question is to Jeremy. Um, given the current state of the city of Melbourne and some of the planning that has been allowable, um, how do you see us being able to reverse that in terms of, are we too far gone, I guess? I don't know, as a city. It'll only take about 40 years for half of those buildings to fall down. Mm. Um, the problem with us is that in the 1960s, Len Lease built this incredible thing called the Strata Title. And the strata title took buildings away from a company title where the building worked as a community to having a building made up of a whole bunch of individuals, uh, which made each one of those apartments a saleable asset, a liquid asset. And so we've got an incredible problem now that we've got all these buildings made up with hundreds of owners, and if they don't all agree on a maintenance program or you know, a flammable cladding solution, then there's an incredible problem with that. So I think that we, I think we'll have an opportunity in about forty or fifty years to actually rebuild a large part of our city, an incredibly expensive opportunity. One of the other things that's happening with climate change is that some of you have probably experienced this: that with changing ocean temperatures, we're getting changing wind speeds further south in this continent, and so we're getting what looks like a changing wind terrain. And so in the city of Melbourne, if our wind terrain changes and our entire city is clad in curtain walling um, that's designed to withstand a particular wind terrain. If that doesn't work, then we've got to literally reclad our entire city. Um, which, you know, I mean, the financial cost of that is, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, so there is an opportunity to change. Um, but I think that we should focus on where are we now and... Um, what, what is every step that we make now? Like if we're looking at 100,000 new Melburnians every year, you know, how do we house them and how do we house them meaningfully? And after 26 years of uninterrupted economic growth in this country, 
how could we still have over 100,000 homeless people in this incredibly wealthy country? So um, someone spoke about, you know, Denmark today and, uh, you know, th their system is that you just apply a, a higher tax and you deal with things like health, um, education and housing people. Finland have no homeless people because when someone's homeless, they build them a home. The brand new New Zealand Prime Minister, who's just had a baby, <laughs> came back and said, we have a housing crisis, let's build 100,000 homes. And she's got straight to work. I don't know what's stopping us. Um, I, I don't know. So the reason that Nightingale exists is because we're doing what the state should be doing. And we will continue ex to exist until someone else, better and more equipped to do it than a group of ragtag architects in Melbourne, can actually do it. Can I just add that the Scandinavians don't complain about their high taxes either. This is a question for Jeremy too. It may seem frivolous, but I think important. Given that retail can be so fluttery these days, have you protected the wine store against maybe having to sell to Hungry Jacks? No, no, it's a really, really good question. So we talk about, you know, so, so we can measure our environmental success. We can measure our financial success. But how do you measure your community success? It's really, really hard. Like, it's all anecdotal evidence. And what we do know is that um, how the building touches the ground is so important and how do you make a vibrant city. And if you look along, um, you know, anywhere around Brunswick, Sydney Road, Ligon Street, Nicholson Street, what you'll see is that the developers focus on selling the apartments because they can sell apartments in Brunswick anywhere up to $10,000 a square metre. But you can only sell retail space in Brunswick for a maximum of about $6,000 a square metre. So you don't worry about the sales on the, on the retail. You sell all the apartments, you settle on all of that, and then the last thing that happens is you've got a sea of empty shop fronts with poorly designed aluminium shop fronts with no... No public generosity, you know, no seats, you know, no kind of fine grain, no sense of invitation, absolutely. And so, um, of course, it gets filled with, you know, uh, a convenience store or, a, you know, a deep fried place. So what we do at Nightingale is that we focus, um, we focus a lot on who's going to take those ground floor tenancies. So at Nightingale One, the little hole in the wall cafe is run by an organisation called Home One. They're 100% not-for-profit. They train youth homelessness in the workplace. They train them there. They work with launch housing to house them. They pay for 100% of their housing in month one. By quarter two, they pay for 75% of their housing. By quarter three, they pay for 50% of their housing. And after they've been there for a year, they transition them down to finally being working and being housed. I mean, it's an incredible organisation. We're, so, I mean, there are so many organisations like that that we're trying to partner with, but the fundamental issue is about um, how do you make them work financially and how do you support them. So we can ask residents from the Commons and Nightingale to shop there and support there. But we're seeing retailers suffer everywhere across the city because it's so much more convenient to shop online. It's so much more convenient to go point-to-point -point transport, get in the Uber and go directly from your door to where you want to go, which means... You don't walk past the wine store on the way home anymore. You don't walk past the cafe anymore. So all of those incidental things that used to happen when you'd walk to the train or the bus or the tram, you know, I worry about how that will work in the future. And I think that as a society, we need to decide to support them. We need to decide you, to step outside. But you mentioned Uber. It's interesting. And we, we were talking yesterday about if we think... For anybody, things that are... Unexpected things change. I mean, Uber, you mentioned, transformed something. Yep. You know? um, and that just was one business that popped up. What is the business that is going to be the Uber of real estate that will kill, kill the big real estate guy in the, with the big suit and the big car? Um, we all know that guy. Um, what is it that's going to make people who own um, investment properties decide that they're just going to rent to people for longer than one year because they want to? Like, why? Why do we all? Why do we have to rent a house for one year? Um, I mean, we block off my, where I live. We block off the street with with cones and play f football, and the cars can go somewhere else. It's, <laughs> Um, not all the time, but we, we're also um, 
I mean, I met a, a designer from Mexico City and that they had run up, which is a city with huge problems, and they'd run a really successful program of people just every now and then taking back the street for kids to play. And um, I think it's something that Australians would feel really uncomfortable about because we all like to play by the rules so much in a way. Um, but a bit of that, um, you know, a bit of pushing those things um, and and also I think never underestimating what what will emerge. You know, your business has emerged and has created a really, really powerful story for other people to then get inspired by. So, um, um, yeah, I, th I think you can never... In 40, it may not take 40 years to start to undo stuff because maybe the financial model just doesn't work anymore, you know. I mean, this... Um, if super companies are de getting out of divesting from carbon, when are they going to divest in badly built buildings? I wonder if I might ask Mary and the other members of the panel to <clears throat> give us their views in a way of what what really is going to be the impact in the for a de community of designers today of the existence of companies like IKEA, which I think. Uh, can be said to be, in a way, revolutionising the approach to taste <coughs> and uh, artefacts on a very, very large scale. Well, Grant and I always um, supported the idea of IKEA. Um, we we tried to do a similar thing in Australia of knock down furniture. We we developed ideas. We took to endless manufacturers and always were knocked back. People said, no, 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 customers will lo lose the screws, you know, can't be done. Um, and we always saw IKEA as um, fulfilling our dream, if you like, of, of good design, thoughtful design, um, good looking and affordable. I, but I think they've gone off the rails lately. I mean, I think they they are producing a bit of rubbish now, and and I think the sense that like fashion, people are seeing it as disposable is very worrying. But I think that the fact that the Chinese have said, you know, we're not going to keep taking your crap anymore, um, means that people will have to be much more thoughtful about what they buy. So whether they buy a, a really affordable IKEA chair or um, something else, you know, something that they spend a lot of money on and keep for, you know, to hand on through the family. I think that people just need to be much more thoughtful. Does that answer the question? Can I add, Mary, I think IKEA, I mean, there are other companies who are not IKEA which you need to be much more worried about. I mean, IKEA, um, yes, it might have problems. Their supply chain, I mean, I know places where they manufacture, in, in countries like Bangladesh and India, they come in with really rigorous labour um, uh, covenants, with environmental covenants, with the kind of how much people are paid, um, what, what, what type of living conditions they have in education. You know, this is a company that actually has a moral charter, whereas there are many companies that sell cheap furniture um, and other products. I mean, you just think of all of the replicas of of your furniture, which are manufactured in China and brought in by Matt Blatt and other companies, um, that comes with none of that stuff. So, I mean, cheap, cheap at scale by a, a well-run company can can be a positive story. Um, but I think people just need to, under, to to really evaluate what cheap means. I mean, how can you buy a pair of jeans for ten dollars? You know, that's impossible. So the idea, um, you know, my son went to the supermarket with my wife to buy an iron and the irons were $14. And he was like, how do you make an iron for $14? You, you can't make an iron for $14. It's the price is paid somewhere in the ecosystem through either someone not being paid enough or the environment paying the price or what have you. But Well, it's yeah. landfill, basically, isn't it? It becomes well, landfill. But actually, you couldn't. That was the most expensive one. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just think that then, um, it's if people don't buy it, then then they can't sell it anymore. You know, the, that's the problem. People buy stuff that is. Well, you're, you're talking yeah. about discerning customers, and people like Robin and Grant and others spend a lot of time trying to um, educate the community about being 
um, thoughtful consumers. Yeah, I just uh, I think people people unfortunately um I mean then that goes back to education doesn't it mm. because if you if you understand that stuff from the beginning it's it's inherent. It's not about buying expensive stuff. It's actually just thinking about how how does this stack up? How do we morally feel? Yeah, I think a lot of it has it uh, uh, one attributes blame but I think the fashion industry has got a lot to answer for because the fashion industry is based on mm. yeah You've got to keep changing, keep changing. If you don't, you're out of step. And that's affected furniture next and then other products. But is it also because we don't have a, a public discussion about design um, and about how one, you know, choosing by design as opposed to choosing by price? And I think, you know, it is concerning one way one goes to Coles or Target or whatever and you can buy T-shirts for children for three or four or less dollars. Um, and all of the, the dilemmas are in that. Who got paid for this? Did they get paid for this? Your iron, does it really function well? Does it have all the functions that you want it to do? How long is it going to last? Those types of questions. Things now are you know, flooding into us. And they have no real value, social value particularly, other than their price and their disposability. I mean, those T-shirts that cost 2 or $3 are only going to last a season. They, again, are, you know, waste. They're ground fill. They don't even stand well in an op shop anymore. It type of reduces that area. So, but I think we don't have a discussion about design, what design is, and um, and how we make decisions about design. I don't think, I think in Australia the discussion about design is very much a discussion about cost and style, the look of things in those ways, as opposed to design principles. Um, you know, who, and I, do, does the design industry itself talk about this? I think my experience is that designers are often... Um, not particularly good at explaining what they do and what their significance and value is. They leave the product to do that. Thank you. I think that raises an excellent question of um, a customer discernment um, when purchasing and making these choices in the um, in in a very um, small, minute um, instance. How do you justify, um, I guess, the luxury of going into thinking about design when you have so many other worries in your life um, whereby, you know, you have to feed for your kids or, you know, um, make sure that they are provided with an education of a certain quality or being able to feed your kids, you know, a substantial meal. And so I think that this question of design is quite a high level need and it's a quite a um, something that's out of reach for a lot of the population. But, but is, it, so. is it out of reach no, no, to ask sorry. for a well-designed product that is long-lasting, that doesn't cost heaps. Can't I have a saucepan that is... I mean, this is a very old thing, but I've thought about this recently. Um, they don't cost a lot, but do they... You know, can't I have one that cleans easily? Can't I have one that sits on a stove easily? All of those types of things. They're very basic. I want an iron that does what I need. And I want to be able to get that, you know. So there's things about understanding what... Well, I don't think design needs to be expensive. I think it just needs to be... Um, it, it needs to be stuff that functions really, you know, stuff that functions really well. I know, you know, and then you can still feed your children. I, would, I agree with you to a great extent, which is like... I don't, th I, I don't see that as a... For the average person, I don't think it's a design conversation. Mm. I think it's about quality and transparency. Transparency, like what, where do things come from? And, mm. and I think one of the things that we've lost as a, as, a, as a... Certainly in our society and in many other societies, what is being lost is the capacity, the ability to read what an object is. 
So we, uh, humans for many, many thousands of years had an understanding of material and an understanding of where things came from. What's that made of? That's wood, that's clay, that's you know, ceramic, what have you. And, and it's something that's part of human culture. But we have just, things have just become invisible. You have no idea. And, and it, nor, I mean, the, the, an iPhone or a mobile phone, you have no idea where the materials inside that that product come from. Often the companies who make them have no idea where those materials are coming from. So yes, I think it's, it's too much to expect the average person to be going, I want the best design thing, but what, what I think we should be encouraging people to think about, even, even if you're doing it through the lens of waste, like where is this, how long is this going to last and, and is it worth, or what's, the, or what's the consequence of, you know, the health consequence or the, you know, to the individual. Can, um, can I give you one really simple uh, example of, you know, how do you pay something that's – how do you pay for a piece of design that's more expensive but you save money and you save the environment simultaneously? And that would be the single-use disposable cup, mm -hmm. right? We've all watched War on Waste. So I use a Joko cup. Mm -hmm. I haven't used – I've never used a, a takeaway cup since December 2016 because I can go without a coffee for four hours. I'll be okay if I don't have my Joko with me. But Joko, you know, it's designed in, um, you know, in the Bellarine Peninsula in, uh, in, in Victoria. Um, and that's something that, that I paid $20 for and I've used it, you know, I don't know, a thousand times rather than having a piece of paper with a plastic liner in it mm. which I can't put in the recycling bin and I can't put in the waste bin. Um, but I even think it probably goes for the into what you don't buy is actually you know like if we think of what's going on with just with straws like that is that's got way more so social impact way more ecological impact than someone designing a metal straw you know i mean that's i see designers quite often who think they're doing the right thing designing an unnecessary product out of a, a slightly better material um, and thinking that they're doing the right thing, and that, that and that I can understand why they're doing that, but but just the capacity to look into it and go, we don't actually, maybe I just shouldn't design it at all. Hi, I wanted to pick up on uh, Denise's point earlier around how we talk about design, and I think also this ties into what Ewan's saying around how I have to out myself as a designer first. Sorry, it's like an AA meeting. Uh, <laughs> But what I'm interested in is that is how do we have this conversation beyond the closed environment that we're in like today? These are people who are predominantly designers, design students, people who are interested in design, who have a sophisticated understanding of what the process is, we hope. We hope. Um, how do we take that conversation to the broader community who are the end users of design and are often the commissioners of design even though they don't know it? I think the conversation is actually already happening. It's just that it's not... What, what designers find frustrating is that they're not instigating it. You know, like... And, and it's actually... If we think about the awareness around where our food comes from, what's going into our oceans, what are, you know, the, the, the fact that we all have come to terms with the fact that plastic is a material that we need to stop using as a, 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 totally, um, not just reduce the amount of plastic... Um, these things gradually gain, and this takes time. But the plastic thing just seems to be going, you know, you can just see it in, in the media how it's just going up and up and up, and it's ocean plastic pollution. Um, and um, it's not necessarily about replacing plastic with another material. It might just, just be about reducing the amount of things that we make out of it. Um, so I do think the public get... So I see that as a design conversation, but I don't see it as being framed in the language of design or led by designers, which is possibly better because I'm not sure that designers are great at leading those conversations. What, what, what is important for designers to do is to be provocateurs in that space and to produce critical objects or campaigns or things and lend their creativity. I mean, then the example I was going to put in my slide is if you look at the refugee flag that was designed by a young Syrian graphic designer for the Olympics in Rio, um, they have a simple act by a designer that gave a whole identity to a nation of stateless people. But that conversation was already going on. But 
it was so smart to see someone who could just crystallise it into an object. And that's, I think, that's what we kind of need more of, that sense of a design. That she, she's not going to make any money out of that, but damn, she's famous, you know. But I think, <clears throat> I think also that we need to be aware of the context that we're operating in. And, um, you know, if we look at the political and, and, and economic uh, values that drive our society, um, it, it explains why we are an individualistic, materialistic, consumptive uh, community. Because of the belief in trickle-down economics and the belief that consumption is driving that economic cycle. And, um, it, you know, in education, it, I, I'm facing it every day, it's not about creating um, curious, democratic citizens. It's about creating competitive individuals who will be good consumers. And it's very hard to swim against that stream. That's what we're talking about. It's what you're doing. It's what I've been trying to do. It's, it's against the cultural, political, social stream, economic stream. I think... Is that too... Is that sounding too um, no, extreme or... No, I, th I think that's... All right. One of the things that is, you know, it's very easy to blame designers. And it's, you know... But when you start to unpack it, it's also, you know, as um, both you and Mary have said, it's the situation, the economic situation in which designers work as well. And there are so many other aspects pulling at it. For instance, Featherston Design ultimately, you know, ceases because they cannot get um, manufacturers who will support research and development of new products, you know. So there's... So many other aspects that come into it as well, I think. Um, and I think Ewan's right in the notion of, you know, provocateur is a, is a really good way to, to probe, to prompt um, debate as well. I think there's an opportunity in advocacy and there's an opportunity today with 3D printing, with online funding, with peer-to-peer -peer financing. If you can't find a manufacturer to build your design today, mm. I think that you've got this thing called the internet which enables you to link with six billion other people and find someone else that will back you or find a way to do it anyway. And, you know, just commit, take a bunch of risk and do it. And then educate everyone along the way and try your best. You know, I think we've all just got to draw the line in the sand, right? Thank you all for your talks. They were amazing. I gleaned a lot from them, so I appreciate being here. Um, my question actually continues on, Jeremy, from what you were just saying of considering that, as you were saying, Mary, a lot of the pressures around design now are because of the economy and how um, the politics of desire has changed so rapidly in the 21st century um, in terms of consumerism. And so my question is to you how, as we hopefully late capitalism fails, and we're in a, in a stage of transition, as we maybe were in mid-century, um, in potentially moving into the shared economy or the experience economy and seeing that it's not necessarily about ownership anymore and power through ownership. And I know all of you have touched on that in terms of accessibility and scalability, but how do you think that that will look in the future with design in the shared economy or in um, the experience economy because, of course, design is very much about experience. You see something beautiful, it makes you feel something. Um, and how could potentially design be at the forefront of changing the economy and changing people's desires to realise that they actually want something different to just fast, uh, cheap crap? So... That is what you were all talking about, but I suppose how could you centre design in the future of shifting the economy to shared and experiential? I think I can talk to the first part of that, which is about the shared economy, I think, will help drive us towards better quality design and better built outcomes. If you think about everyone owns a cordless drill, can I just see a quick show of hands? Who's got a cordless drill in their house? Um, yeah, you think you do. Who's used, who's, who's used that cordless drill in the last month? Oh, five people. Oh, no, seven people. That's, that's actually great. 
Because I think the average use of a cordless drill is something like, you know, half an hour of its entire life, you know. So everyone in my apartment building's got one and no one uses it. So we could have one cordless drill. And instead of having, you know, everyone's got their Azito drills from Bunnings sitting there, which are hopeless, we could have one, you know, great AEG drill in there that everyone gets to use. And I think that, you know, you think about... Um, uh, yeah, like ride sharing and what that looks like in the future. It's not going to be a bunch of, you know, crappy fuel guzzling cars. It will be a bunch of very, very efficient, you know, hydrogen fuel cell cars doing that work, you know. So I think in the first part of your question, I think that the sharing economy will help us get towards better designed, better built outcomes and more sustainable outcomes. How do we as designers encourage that? Uh, that's the bit I don't know. Well, I, I see people doing interesting things like um, open sourcing their designs. So we think about, I mean, I think the city of Melbourne's about to open source all of the furniture and lighting that they've ever designed and they've done a lot. But there's people like Joris Lahman, who's a Dutch designer who's at the forefront of design and robotics. And he, he open sources stuff. But he, well, um, what's about to happen in that space is that you have... So if we imagine the 20th century was about centralised manufacturing in huge factories um, owned by huge corporations, that that is, granularly, that is sort of breaking apart into, into being more granular, but in 20 or 30 years you will have um, an amalgam of kind of robotic manufacturing in often places that we really underestimate now. So if you, if you think of the innovation that's going on in, in some parts of Africa and South America and Southeast Asia, you're going to have these high-tech um, cities which have amazing capability. They're accessing designs um, for things that could only be made by Swiss pharmaceutical companies now. Um, which we'll be able to make, um, you know, you're talking things like um, prosthetic parts or things for, for delivery of, of health outcomes, so things like um, 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 spectacles or what have you, um, just being produced really cheaply in anywhere. Um, so that flips a lot of stuff, um, and it also means that the kind of, the, 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 the means of production is essentially redistributed. Um, so it's actually redistributed around um, creativity and education as well, and that's what's really interesting with with the, te the teaching of design is it's um, it's the most entrepreneurial and the most creative who can apply that stuff the best, not necessarily the people with the biggest setup, which is what 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 we currently have. So I think it's quite ex an exciting time. I don't think it's the end of capitalism or anything. It's more like a redistribution driven by technology. Um, um, which has a which then has a consequence of of giving more opportunity to more more people, um, and really especially in developing countries because I think that Australian designers are surprisingly for where we're placed in the region are very focused on Australia um, or Europe, and we have you know you've got a billion people in India who 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 um, deserve well designed products and services. Um, and health and education and clean water and all of the stuff that goes with that. I, I think I like to see designers dematerialize their design more. So get out of the idea that you have to design a physical object and maybe what we're applying our creativity to is designing a thing that could be printed or or a, or a piece of service design or an app or a campaign. Um, and those things are actually easier to sell now than physical objects. Um, so it's, I think it's a very, very fluid space, but it's quite interesting. I wonder if I might ask a question actually about the, the inverse of that in a way about the experience of design. Um, you know, the idea of the, the shopping mall now taking up, hoovering up all the local shops, uh, but also the, the idea of the local workshop as well, so how people might get to experience how complex or easy a thing is by actually making it. And so I'm sure there's very kind of technical things for the medical services we need at the very high level, but also experientially talking about you know, timber, clay or metal, that they're very simple things that could be made, uh, loved and then repaired. So, you know, how is the local going to come back into all of this in terms of um, design experience, production and appreciation? It, there's a young architect in Melbourne whose work I've only discovered in the last week preparing for this, who is um, doing interiors but uh, using recycled but they've 
beautiful, they're inclusive interiors. So, you know, it, that they take wheelchairs, etc. But they look like your ultimate um, beautiful um, modernist home. But these are renovations. But one of the things that she's doing, which I find really fascinating, is that she is you know, not going out and buy. They're not going out and buying new bathroom fittings, but rather she's you know taking old old bathroom fittings, wonderful pink um, basins, for example, and, the, and, um, and using those in the most creative way. And the cabinetry in the bathroom is, you know, furniture, beautifully recycled. It's, not, it's just really superb stuff. And I just love this notion of that, the combination of, of recycling in this way, in very, very stylish way. There's nothing grunge, there's nothing green about it. It's really something that you would like to have. Can, can I talk about the, the idea of local and how important it is to build community? I was talking to someone from the multi, Multicultural Affairs um, Department and what they were saying is to me that one of the most successful places for um, male refugees to come and join is men's sheds. And so you think that'd be a very white Australian thing. But men's sheds popping up everywhere are actually working across a number of different kind of demographics. And all that, all that we need to do is kind of, you know, advertise that. Last time I was in Copenhagen, I went to a cafe and they had like a fabrication lab attached to the cafe so you can buy a coffee and then go and digitally print something or CNC cut something while you're having your coffee. So imagine the future of the men's shed is also a digital fabrication where you can download your, you know, your wiki house that you've just bought online for five pounds, you know, print out, you know, your house or get it CNC cut while you're meeting with your, your community and then you ask them to help you bring that back to your, you know, <laughs> your, your, re your reacquired street because you don't need car parking lots anymore and assemble your house. So I think there's, you know, there's some opportunity in that and there's some opportunity for us to do that together. And I think it kind of links into this question here that, you know, how do we use, how do we use all of this retail? So, so at the moment, you know, online is, so you're right, shopping centres are killing strip retail. And so suburbs are dying, you know, and Chadston is seemingly booming. But at the same time, Chadston and vicinity and Westfield are all hurting because of what's happening online. And so I think it's only going to be a matter of time before there's, you know, car sharing, you know, is going to mean that we've got all these car spaces and empty car parks in 15 years' time. We're going to have a lot of empty retail space in 15 years' time. All of our artists are currently being pushed out of the edge of the city because of gentrification. You know, um, is there an opportunity, you know, in the future, you know, yeah, less than 40 years to bring them back in and kind of, you know, make our city more vibrant again instead of being, you know, either just massive retail hub, you know, or massive um, commercial hub or acres and acres of monocultural residential that's dead. Um, I, I just wanted to throw in inclusive design. That government legislation comes into this as well and will have an impact because of the government legislation coming, um, about uh, access to technology by, for disability groups. And this is, you know, driving, placing a different agenda on um, software, etc. And I was, again, listening to this Radio National program um, in which the the um, the uh, players and uh, a sorry a visually impaired woman on the panel, very sophisticated woman, talked about the new software that was being designed that allowed her to um, she was in a lift she couldn't find where the buttons were couldn't work out where to go she could talk to this software and it could say tilt your head and the button is there this software also enables her to negotiate and navigate buildings and find where she can go for lunch where she can get coffee what coffee etc and what they were talking about in the in this um, talk was how when the design is in, truly and utterly inclusive and functional, it has benefits for all of us. The, I didn't know, and you may have known, that our text messaging, which originally was very expensive, is now freely available because of the lobbying 
of the disabilities groups. Um, and, you know, and also, as the visually impaired uh, panellist also said, you know, we now all have, um, uh, you know, the subtitles on television, which we all, not the subtitles, you know, the running lines on um, text and television, and we all now take that in as, you know, a natural part of life. But it comes from um, the response by the human rights, by, to sorry, to the disabilities. The Human Rights Commission has at the moment um, set up a project in this area and there is a, you know, and there's government legislation saying that it must happen and there is a commissioner to, you know, over, oversee see this as well. So they're getting together with design communities um, to, to start to talk to disabled people about it. Um, and it's a huge and vast area. So I think that's an interesting way as well. Okay, so um, thank you all of our... Uh, can you help me thank all of our speakers today? So I think it's been a really worthwhile um, afternoon of um, conversation and information. Um, and we'd like to invite you, Heidi and um, Swinburne, we'd like to invite you to um, share a drink outside um, to, the, to the left, outside uh, the door here, before you make your way home. Thank you. <laughs>